Welcome everyone to another lecture in anatomy and today I will talk to you about the anatomy of the diaphragm. So at the end of the lecture guys, the, uh, I'm expecting uh, you be able to describe the gross anatomy of the diaphragm and to determine the location of um, that uh, sheet uh, a plus to define the openings uh, there and what uh, those structures pass through it um, and also um, I'm expecting guys to know about the blood supply and innervation of this very important um, uh, sheet and the function of it. Plus, of course, as usual, we will talk a little bit about the clinical correlations related to the uh, diaphragm. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, give you a brief introduction about the diaphragm. So, again, this is on the right side. This illustration, my friends, shows the uh, diaphragm. Here is like uh, the anterior. Uh, it's a kind of coronal section of the thorax and abdomen plus the pelvis. So you see here is the diaphragm and you know that's located between the thorax up and the abdomen below. So it's not just muscle, it's a muscle and tendon. So we can call it um, a musculotendinous sheet. So this musculotendinous sheet for what we call the diaphragm separates the thorax up from the abdomen uh, below and if you look at it again you will see that there are a couple of structures pass from there from the thorax to the abdomen and from the abdomen to the uh, thorax and as we know that the diaphragm is very important crucial muscle in uh, respiration uh, it's like a dumb shape look at it here so so this dumb shape consists, as you see, from centrally part, which is mainly tendon, and peripherally uh, muscular part, as you see. So the muscular part, uh, of course, arises from the margin of the, you see here, the margin, and of course, the ribs and costal cartilage there and other structures. So the muscular part, um, arises from margin of the thoracic opening and we will talk uh, 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 in details about uh, uh, these uh, 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 the, or the uh, origin of the uh, diaphragm. This is again a diaphragm. You see the centrally uh, placed tendon and the peripherally uh, or perform muscular part. Look at the openings here. We will talk about them. Look at the origin from lumbar part, and here is costal cartilage. Look at it here. It's like a dumb shape, and so forth. We will talk about it. So let us start with the origin. So the diaphragm originated from where? Well, simply we can say, look at this uh, figure here. Although this figure is not related to this figure, right? Anyway, on the right side here. Uh, you know, we remove the right costal cartilage and part from the ribs on the right uh, side in order to expose the diaphragm, right? But here you are looking to the diaphragm anteriorly, right? So, uh, anterior inferior, let us say, this is indeed inferior or anterior inferior. You look to the, inf to the inferior surface of the uh, diaphragm, although you can see the anterior here origin, but anyway, you look into the diaphragm, you are in the abdomen, and you look to the diaphragm inferiorly. Anyway, so the uh, diaphragm originated mainly from three parts. Uh, most uh, anterior look at the sternum here, and this is the xiphoid process. So again, this is the diaphragm. So there is a sternal part. It originates uh, from the uh, first of all the there is a sternal origin here arises from the posterior surface of the xiphoid process look at it here here is the sternal part of the diaphragm that means the part of the diaphragm that originates from the uh, posterior surface of the xiphoid process that's located here right this is number one number two it originates as you see here back again these are coastal cartilage either on the right or on the left it doesn't matter and these are reps especially the lower six ribs. So uh, the second origin will be the costal part. And that means here, as you see, the right costal part 
and here is the left coastal part that means the diaphragm or arising from the deep surface of the um, lower six ribs and their coastal cartilage by this way um, uh, the, uh, by this way you see that they are from formed from the right dumb and on the other side the left dumb right okay now what about the um, the third origin other than the sternal part anteriorly and the coastal cartilage and ribs laterally it originated uh, from uh, the you know coastal cartilage and ribs laterally and anteriorly posteriorly you have the vertebral column but where is it exactly now in the lumbar uh, area so the diaphragm originates from the lumbar uh, uh, let us say the upper three lumbar vertebrae that means uh, L1, 2 and uh, 3 and by this origin look at its origin here look at its origin here so the diaphragm originates from the um, upper three lumbar vertebrae that means L1, 2 and 3 and by this origin it forms for what we call it right cross and left cross this is the right cross here right and this is the left cross and the plus it uh, forms a kind of ligaments arcuate ligaments it's like arch in shape so you have median arcuate here we'll talk about it you have the here is the median and here is the medial and you have also the lateral but we're concerned with the median and medial one uh, uh arcuate uh, ligaments i mean Okay, so let me summarize the origin of the diaphragm uh, lastly. So it originates uh, from three parts, from the posterior surface of the zygoid process here anteriorly, from the what we call sternal part, and the diaphragm has coastal part. That means it originates from the lower six ribs and their coastal cartilage and posteriorly you have a lumbar part in which it forms the right cross the left cross and arcuate ligaments okay so back again to describe the diaphragm because of it's a kind of its origin so it forms like um, a dumb shape so you have the right dumb and you have the left dumb and you have a right cross here look at the right cross that uh, creates a kind of uh, a circle around the esophagus indeed it works as uh, or it's working as a kind of a sphincter for the esophagus right this is the right cross and this is the left cross my friends and you have lastly a central uh, tendon so you have central tendon you have right dumb and left dumb and you have right and left across here is in the posterior abdominal wall here is the um that's what was about the uh we describe the shape of the diaphragm and we also talked about the origin of the diaphragm uh sternal part um coastal part and lumbar part now let us Talk about the insertion of the diaphragm yes it originates from uh, sternal uh, part lumbar part and coastal part but all they inserted here in the central tendon in the central tendon and we mentioned at the uh, very early beginning you, you know guys that the diaphragm composed from tendinous part and muscular part so it's a muscular tendinous sheet so anyway um the uh, diaphragm inserted in the central tendon as you see and you know that the central part here is partially fused with the inferior surface of fibrous pericardium you know the heart is here and here is the um, pericardium that encircles the heart and it's partially fused and in the caliber if you look at the caliber you will see it's really fused with the upper surface of the central part of the tendon 
right, of the diaphragm. Okay, that means the diaphragm is in the central tendon here, right? Now, um, as I mentioned um, about the uh, right and left cross, or crew right to say, that look at the right cross. This is, we will talk about it, but just let us talk briefly for now about it. This is the right cross. So fibers, as I mentioned, from the right cross, uh, uh, kind of uh, from the right side uh, of L1, 2, and 3, you know, originate and so forth. So some of these uh, fibers passes up and moved. If this is the right and this is the left, so it moved to the left, as you see, and to surround the uh, esophageal orifice here, at the level of T10, and it's a kind of sling-like loop, as you see, and it works, as I mentioned earlier, as a sphincter, and to prevent the regurgitation of the um, stomach content to the thoracic part of the esophagus. That means it prevents a kind of, it creates, a, it, uh, it works as a sphincter to prevent the return back or regurgitation of the contents from the stomach up into the esophagus. Okay, which is good, right? So, yes, this is the right across that we talk about. Look, it originates from the right lateral side of lumbar, uh, vertebrae number one, two, and three. That means it originated from lateral side of the lumbar vertebrae, uh, the first, second, and third one, and the intervertebral uh, discs there. So this is the right crust, and it goes up, and it creates a kind of a loop around the esophagus, which is indeed, it's like a sphincter. But look at the left cross. The left cross is a little bit shorter than the right cross on the left side. Again, originates from the left lateral side of the uh, vertebrae of the first and just the second uh, lumbar vertebrae and ascends on up as I mentioned. Look at the medial side of the um, uh, medial side of the right cross and left cross. Yes, this is the right cross and this is the left cross. So medially, let me draw it here. This is the medial border of the left cross and this is the medial border of the right cross. They united here to form an arcuate ligament. We call it median arcuate ligament. Median arcuate ligament. We will talk about it. And also, lateral to the um, right cross and left cross, you have, yes, the median, median it means, when you say an median, it means in the midline, in the midline of any structure, in the midline of the liver, midline of whatever the structure you are talking about, mid, the midline of your body as, 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 as a whole, this is median. But when you say medial, it's just lateral to midline. If this is the midline, so just lateral to midline, we call it medial, right? So uh, also, uh, lateral to the arcuate here, you have the medial and lateral arcuate ligaments. So you have medial and lateral arcuate ligaments. That means how many arcuate ligaments we have? We have three. Right, we have the three, the median one formed by the union of uh, right across with the left across just anterior to the vertebral column. Here is the aorta, you will see it later. Okay, he is like a cadaver, and you guys here see the diaphragm, it's already cut in here, and here is the uh, right lung, the inferior. Uh, pull or uh, border of the left, the right lung and left lung. Anyway, here is the diaphragm, and here is the uh, central part of the diaphragm, where is the pericardium of the heart located and diffused there. And here is the inferior vena cava. We'll talk about it. And this is the right cross. If this is the right cross, right, and this is part of left cross, you will see that this is the uh, esophagus and 
here is my friend you will see the aorta here right this is the aorta right okay we'll talk about all these structures so yes here let us uh, again talk a little bit about the arcuate ligaments uh, now I already explained that the medial border of the two crura I mean the right across the medial border of the right across here and the medial border of the left across uh, they are connected to each other or they create a kind of median arcuate ligament that crosses over the anterior surface of the aorta this is very important this is the aorta so anterior to it you have the median arcuate ligament okay that's it just remind you this is the right across that goes up and it creates a kind of a sling around the esophagus which is uh, like a sphincter anyway so this is the median arcuate ligament now lateral to the right this is the right across and this is the left across lateral on each side to both the crura you have the medial arcuate ligament one on the right and one on the left again they are like a tendinous arch formed by a fascia covering the covering what okay this is very important so the medial arcuate we, we said that the median just to cross over the aorta but medial arcuate ligament cross over and anterior to the psoas uh, muscles right here is the psoas uh, major and minor if it exists right so you see how they are arch anterior to the psoas um, muscles here mainly let's say the major but also you have the minor and so forth and uh, now it originates or extends from where to there okay let me use this we know the median arcuate ligament that's it how it's formed now the medial arcuate ligament you know it extends this is the medial arcuate and this is the medial arcuate so it originates from the lateral side of l1 and l2 l1 and l2 and extends laterally on both sides to insert it on the transverse process of L1 vertebra this is L1 vertebra this is the body and this is a transverse process right and there's a transverse process here so the medial arcuate ligament this tendinous sheath uh, originates from the lateral side of L1 and L2 and inserted in the tip of transverse process or transverse parts of L1 now from there there is another sheet we said that there is another sheet right which is the lateral which is the lateral arcuate ligament lateral arcuate ligament as you see i continued the journey from the end or the medial arcuate ligament ends so it started or extended from the transverse process of uh, of l1 laterally inserted this is the rib right this is the lower border of rib number this is rib number 12 so to the lower border of rib number 12. okay now this is the lateral arcuate ligament excellent so it it arts over what it arts over a muscle which is the uh what we call it quadratus lumborum muscle quadratus lumborum is the lumbar area and it's quadrangular in shape we will talk about it in the posterior abdominal wall but just i'm trying to uh, make sure you can remember it right so we finished the median arcuate ligament anterior to the arch of the anterior to the abdominal aorta and we have the lateral uh, the medial arcuate ligament arched over the psoas muscles and we have the if this is median and this is medial and here you have the lateral arcuate ligament they arch over the quadratus lamporum that's it and they extended from here to there and so forth okay so now you have an idea 
uh, a good idea, I would say, about the origin and insertion um, of the and the shape of the diaphragm. And at the beginning, we mentioned that the diaphragm has a um, couple of openings. You have three main openings, right? You have three main openings. And you know, always, we prefer to use uh, the vertebral column as a reference for the surface anatomy. That means you have three major openings and each one located, I mean the openings in the diaphragm, each one located at a, a, a level, right? A different um, level uh, related to the vertebral column. So you have three major openings, one at the level of T, 8, 10, 12, 8, 10, 12, which is very easy to remember. So, the caval opening from its name, this is the caval opening from its name, it lies at the, first of all, at the, this is the highest one, it's located at the level of T8 um, vertebra, and which is very interesting here, this is the only opening located, a major opening, I mean, located in the central tendon. That means, yes, you have a three main openings. The only one in the central tendon, as you see here, the only one is the caval opening. Uh, we will talk about the structures passive from there, but for now, the uh, vena cava passive from the inferior vena cava passive from there. Anyway, let us now to jump to the um, second opening which is the esophageal opening. We call them like caval opening, esophageal opening, aortic opening, related to the major structures pass from there. So caval opening at the level of T8, there is inferior vena cava, and other structures, we'll talk about them. But now, a little bit down, let us move to T10, in which there is an opening for the esophagus at the level of T10. And it's located, as I mentioned earlier, you remember the right crust that goes up from the lateral side of L1, 2, and 3, and it goes up and form like a sling around the esophagus, which is like, that works as a sphincter, right? This is the, um, it's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit to the uh, left side, right? Now, also, a little bit uh, to the left side, you have another opening, which is the aortic opening. The aortic, uh, aortic opening, uh, it's located the, the most inferior one, which is located at the level of um, T12, uh, just anterior to the uh, vertebral column, and the opening just anterior to the vertebral number, uh, thoracic vertebral number 12. So, easy to uh, remember. Now, you know, again, this is a cadaver, and uh, what you see here, my friends, this is again the diaphragm, you see, right? And on the central tendon here, a little bit to the right, you have the opening for Vira Vina Cava for now, which is the caval opening, and you have an opening for the um, esophagus here, and inferiorly, you have an opening for the um, uh, aorta, right? This is for aorta, in which this is the right across, and this is the left across, and the, uh, it creates a kind of arch here, what we call median arcuate arch. Now, this is an opening for inferior vena cava. This is the inferior vena cava, but these are the um, hepatic vein. Right, right, left and middle one, forget that, but is the opening at the end, right, of the, in the diaphragm. Okay, look at the uh, right thumb, look at the left thumb, look at the uh, uh, central tendon here. So, uh, yes, we uh, got an idea about the major openings in the diaphragm and they are located in which and which levels, right? T8, 10, 12, which is easy to remember. Caval opening, esophageal opening, aortic opening. And I mentioned that their names, the names of the opening, indicate 
kind of the major structures passing from there. So let us start with the cavel opening at the level of uh, T8. So what you see here, what passes from there is the inferior vena cava, which is very important, and a branch from the uh, right phrenic nerve. You know that the diaphragm, we'll talk about that, innervated mainly by the phrenic nerves, right phrenic and left phrenic. But the right phrenic, you see here, this is the right phrenic nerve, so passes to the inferior surface of the diaphragm. You look to the inferior surface now, right? You look to the inferior surface of the diaphragm. So it passes through the cabal opening. Remember that. While the left one, no. We will talk about it. So, for caval opening, you have the inferior vena cava and you have the right phrenic nerve, which is very important. Okay. Now, esophageal opening. You know from the GI system that this is a esophagus and it's a level of TD10. And what passes from there is the esophagus. And you know the friends of esophagus, the right vagus, you see here, and the left vagus nerves. Right, so what passes from there first, first of all, the esophagus and uh, the right vagus and left vagus, and you know that you have a couple of small veins and arteries like vessels. There, we call them the esophageal branch of left gastric vessels. Esophageal branch, they just supply and drain the blood from the lower part of esophagus, right? The abdominal part. So, we call them esophageal branch of left gastric vessels and lymphatic vessels as well. Okay, that was about the esophageal opening. What about the aortic opening? From its name, you see here that uh, uh, we have the uh, aorta, which is very important, and you have this lymphatic duct, major lymphatic duct, that drains the lymph from the abdomen there up. We call it thoracic duct. Maybe you remember that from lymphatic system, right? So you have the thoracic duct, thoracic duct, and sometimes the azygous vein, azygous vein that's formed in the abdomen, so sometimes it ascends through the aortic opening, sometimes not, right? So just to know that the azygous vein, and we have one azygous vein, one just, you don't have one on the right one, you have just one azygous vein on the right that ascends up ultimately and drains to superior vena cava. Anyway, so you have the right azygous, but on the left side you have hemiazygous. Hemiazygous. Okay, so let me raise these things and let me remind you about what I mentioned earlier about the caval opening that. Um, uh, 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 contains or such bands from there, the inferior vena cava and right phrenic nerve. But somebody can say, yes, this is the right phrenic nerve. That's, that's from the caval opening. What about the left phrenic nerve? Yes, this is the left phrenic nerve. So the left phrenic nerve just passes and on the left side just anterior to the uh, uh, anterior to the central uh, tendon, anterior to the central part of the tendon on the left side. So the left phrenic nerve passes in the muscular part. You see, it pushes the muscular part. Where exactly? Just anterior to the central, to the left part of the central tendon. Right here is the the left phrenic uh, nerve. Right. So, one else I would like to say, although it's not written there, but uh, if you look to the caval opening, you have three major openings, right? Caval, esophageal, uh, and aortic opening. The caval opening is the only opening that uh, exists in the central tendon. This is number one. Plus, if you look to the vessels, I mean inferior vena cava and inferior vena cava and the aorta, you would see that they are like protected. That means the blood flow will not be affected by the movement of the diaphragm. You know that the diaphragm is in continuous movement, like up and down, up and down. So that means the movement of the diaphragm will not affect the blood flow of uh, the blood flow in general. How? 
First of all, let us come to the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava, it's not in the muscular part. It's in the central part. That means the contraction, the movement of the diaphragm will not affect, will not sequeeze, will not create a kind of pressure on the inferior vena cava. Number one. Number two, look at the diaphragm. It's located, indeed, it's not in the diaphragm. It's just behind the diaphragm. Look, this is the diaphragm. So the aorta just passes behind the, behind the diaphragm. That means it will not be affected by the movement of the diaphragm. It's not in the muscular part, right? So the blood flow through vessels of your vena cava and aorta will not be affected by the movement of the diaphragm, right? But look at the esophagus. We need to be like encircled by, you know, this is the right cross at, that creates a kind of a sling around the esophagus, which is like, uh, that works, you know, a kind of a sphincter. Uh, that means it doesn't matter, right? We need that sphincter, and we need the esophagus to be like uh, guarded by this uh, sphincter, but not the blood to flow, right? Okay, that was in general where we have like structures pass from the major openings, but we cannot ignore other structures like, for example, the greater, lesser, and least of the axis there uh, of like greater and lesser is splanchnic nerves. You can see here is the greater splanchnic nerves. They pass through the crura on each side, right? That means he, you have here greater splanchnic nerve on the left and one on the right, so they pass on the right across and through the left across itself. This is number one. Okay, number two, what do we have here? you have the hemiazygos. Here is the hemiazygos vein. That's on the left side. So, mainly, listen, mainly, why I'm saying that? Because the hemiazygos and the azygos vein, that's not shown here, although it's, it's uh, drawn here, there's a variation on the origin in the pathway, on the... Uh, and so forth so there is variations because you know they are veins and the veins don't respect the rules of anatomy so anyway here's the hemiazygos um you see pass through the left cross because this is the left cross right so this is a hemiazygos and most importantly you maybe you know or something called the um, the uh, sympathetic trunk, which is like pigeon string on each side of the vertebral column, starting from cervical area all the way down uh, to the lumbar and sacral area. So this is the sympathetic trunk here on both sides. So the sympathetic trunk on the right and the left may be passed posterior to the medial arcuate ligament. This is the medial arcuate ligament on the left and this is on the right so behind them on each side of the vertebral column you have a sympathetic trunk that means sympathetic trunk behind the medial arcuate ligaments on either side also uh, let us uh, remember the internal thoracic arteries and uh, on both sides that divided at the level of sixth costal cartilage in two uh, uh, superior epigastric artery that you see here and the uh, 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 musculophrenic uh, artery is superior epigastric artery or musculophrenic so this is the superior epigastric artery that passes and just anterior to the diaphragm and just the that means between the ribs or cartilage here and the diaphragm right okay now what about the uh, 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 innervation of the diaphragm pretty easy direct forward you know that we always say c3 4 5 keeps the diaphragm alive right so that means to keep the diaphragm alive and to keep like the breathing and stay like pretty normally and stay alive, you need to protect C3, 4, and 5, from which the phrenic, right and left phrenic nerves uh, come from. So, from the cervical uh, area, you got 
and of course e3 4 and 5 with the anastomos there or plexus anastomos the creative kind of right and left phrenic nerves and both descend until they reach the diaphragm and you know the right phrenic nerve pushes the or passes with the inferior vena cava through the um caval opening until it reaches the inferior surface of the diaphragm while the left phrenic nerve pushes the muscular part of the diaphragm just until it turns the central part of the tendon on the left side and you see here this is the left phrenic nerve so the diaphragm as a muscular tendinous part that means there is a motor supply and there is sensory supply you have to differentiate between those right so come now to the motor that um, uh, uh, that has really a major role in the contraction of the diaphragm right so the motor nerve supply from the phrenic nerves that's it now what about the sensation will the sensation from the central uh, part you know that uh, here's just extra details you know that the diaphragm from up and below you know covered by uh, a serous membrane that means if this is the diaphragm so above it you have the pericardium and the pleura right and inferiorly you have the abdomen and the abdomen lined by peritoneum parietal peritoneum so the uh, parietal pleura here and the peritoneum covering the central surface of the diaphragm so the sensation from there uh, transmitted through again through the phrenic nerves that means phrenic nerves not just the motor but also sensation from central part of the diaphragm now what about the sensation from the peripheral part of the diaphragm right from peripheral part well you know the we have intercostal nerves we have the lower six intercostal nerves so the lower six intercostal nerves laterally they carry sensations from the side of the diaphragm right here is the nerve supply of the diaphragm now uh, well during the physical examination and uh, especially during the percussion you need to uh, know where is the uh, remember where is the uh, uh, the level of the diaphragm you know you have right dumb which is higher than a little bit the left dumb because of the liver located here right so mainly the right dumb located at the level of rib number five while the left dumb a little bit like uh, inferior to it and it's located uh, at the level of fifth intercostal space relatively somebody can say yes this is x-ray how can i define where is the fir first second etc where's there yes you see the ribs from the back but look at the shadow anteriorly follow the laser follow the laser log here is the shadow of the first rib you see the shadow of the first rib and this is the shadow of the second rib right and this is the shadow of the third one and the fourth one and here is the fifth one look in the background right so this is the level of the fifth rib while here the at the level of fifth intercostal space that means between rib number five and six relatively but you know you have to remember that that they are from you know varies during the breathing right because move up and down up and down so this is relatively uh, now briefly uh, uh let me remind you with uh, like a um, couple of cases like for example uh most of us sometime you know we get something called hiccup uh, in which um, it's uh, what's the hiccup? Hiccup is like uh, involuntary spasmodic contraction of the diaphragm, uh, usually accompanied by uh, approximation of the vocal cord and the closure of um, gloss of the larynx. So it's common condition in normal individual, right? And usually, you know, uh, does happen usually after eating and drinking uh, because of uh, you know, and so and as, um, as a consequence. For that, the uh, what happened is just gastric irritation of the vagus nerves, and 
and ultimately you get like involuntary contraction of the diaphragm for what we call hiccup. Now, also the diaphragm, you know, which is uh, uh, the uh, major, I would say, muscle in the respiration, and so, um, you know, innervated by phrenic nerves, so the any cut for one of them, like, can cause uh, paralysis of that part of the um, diaphragm, I mean, right or uh, left, and uh, on both sides would be like, fatal um penetration any like uh stamina one or whatever uh you name it's like penetration at the end uh to the diaphragm below the level of the nipple um would be like um uh, sometimes cause and damage to the diaphragm like until proven otherwise right because you know we mentioned earlier the level of right drum at the level of fifth rib while the left one a little bit like inferior to that this um uh what we see here is like hiatal hernia uh, this uh topic explained in details in the lecture of esophagus so you can go there and um uh, watch that video but for now you know this is the esophagus that passes through the um uh, the diaphragm you see here at the level of t10 and you know it is the stomach anyway some you know on this part you know have two types uh, mainly most common two types of hiatal hernia you see here is the paraesophageal uh, hiatal hernia in which uh look at the esophagus Look at the cardia, still it's in its place. And here is just the peritoneum you see here. Look at the peritoneum. And often, like part from the fundus of the stomach, there is the fundus of the stomach goes up into the thoracic cavity. And because the esophagus and the cardia still, and you know, the right crust that works as a sphincter, they are still in a place, so you don't expect like a regurgitation uh, or reflex uh, of gastric content up. No, it still is functioning very well. But in the second type of hiatal hernia, what we call sliding hiatal hernia, you see, he's like not just the peritoneum but also um, the cardia as you see here moved up part from the fundus also goes up that means the what the function uh, uh, of the not just the diaphragm but also the right cross will be weakened and that means you expect a re gastric reflex up and regurgitation of the gas content up in the stomach you see here how they indicated like erosion here in the lower part of the uh, uh, esophagus so uh, uh, you can here is like in the uh, uh, parium here you see the hiatal hernia here maybe parasophageal right and here is the uh, stomach and lastly i would like uh if you're interested to know more about the blood supply of the diaphragm you you remember as i mentioned the internal thoracic arteries that divided into uh superior epigastric arteries you see here and the musculophrenic arteries so these like the musculophrenic and um the these the musculophrenic arteries and for what we call the pericardio or pericardiacophrenic arteries those are branched from internal uh, thoracic arteries i mean the musculophrenic and pericardiacophrenic arteries those supply the superior part of the diaphragm right the superior part of the diaphragm while the inferior part of the diaphragm here like uh, 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 supplied by inferior phrenic arches where they are look at the abdominal the abdominal aorta here the first branch after it passes through the aortic opening is the inferior phrenic arches these are the inferior phrenic arches that means the inferior phrenic arteries branch from the abdominal aorta supply the inferior surface of the 
uh, sorry, inferior surface of the diaphragm. Somebody can say this is our inferior phrenic arts, but where's the um, superior phrenic arts? Yes, you have also superior phrenic artery here, right? That also supply the upper part of the diaphragm and the superior phrenic arts, they are branched from abdominal aorta, right? So in summary, if you have this diaphragm, so uh, here is the uh, ab the thoracic aorta. Once it passes the diaphragm, it becomes abdominal aorta. From the thoracic aorta, you have the superior phrenic artery or arteries, and you have internal thoracic arteries. Internal thoracic arteries, they give the pericardiacophrenic arteries, and you know divided into superior epigastric and muscular um, phrenic so the muscular phrenic arteries all of these arteries the muscular phrenic peri uh, pericardiaco uh, phrenic and superior uh, phrenic arteries they supply the superior part or superior part of the diaphragm while the from the abdominal aorta you have the inferior phrenic arteries right inferior phrenic arteries here's the mainly they supply the inferior surface of the uh, diaphragm so that was about the anatomy of the diaphragm uh, we explained the shape the uh, position the origin the insertion the openings and the contents pass from the uh, through the diaphragm the innervation and the blood uh, supply and a little bit like about the clinical correlation related to the diaphragm. Hope you will find value in it. These are our references and uh, thank you.